Let's take our Bibles again back to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, it's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We saw our Lord's compassionate plea in verse 13, enter, it's in a command, enter by the narrow gate, the straight gate, Uh, it's a few there be that find it, it's narrow, it's straight. we, when we come to Christ, we have to humble ourselves. We have to acknowledge our inability by our own works or religion, following rite and ritual ceremony that uh, we can do nothing good ourselves to enter into the kingdom of God. But we have to acknowledge our sin and our helplessness. We have to repent of our sin, and we have to then trust in uh, in the finished work, in the death and the blood uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we got to uh, the application that we've uh, studied on in verse 24. Therefore, that's the application. Our Lord is drawing a conclusion. He made an appeal, and he makes now an application. So what we're going to consider this morning and look at is how to prepare ourselves and how to respond to suffering. And as I thought upon this, I thought we should consider uh, the, the various types of suffering that we go through. There's different categories of suffering, uh, different reasons for our suffering. And uh, so I jotted down a number of areas in which suffering comes. Uh, These are all different areas. Uh, One, the first source or category of suffering is just general suffering. This is the result of the fall. We live in a sinful world, a fallen world. We are under the judgment of God. This world is doomed. And uh, so we realize living in this world that is cursed uh, by sin under the power uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the devil, the God of this age, that whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, that we all are going to suffer because that's just part of living in this world. We're all subject to it. So there's general suffering. Suffering. But then there are certain ones that are particular to a Christian. And one is uh, corrective suffering. And that is that when we, uh, as a Christian, sin and uh, dishonor God in our life, do the things we shouldn't do, that there is corrective suffering. We see that in 1 Corinthians 11 when the Corinthian believers uh, uh, dishonored the Lord's table, and that, and Paul says that's why there's among you those that uh, uh, are sick, and there are others who have fallen asleep. In Second Corinthians chapter five, there was this man uh, who was having a sexual affair with his stepmother, and Paul said in Second Corinthians or Second uh, Corinthians chapter. Chapter 5, that he has turned over such a one to Satan for the destruction of the body. There's corrective suffering. And for the Christian, there is suffering for righteousness' sake. And this is in 1 Peter. Uh, twice the Apostle Peter says that we, uh, we should never suffer for, uh, or rather, never rejoice that you are suffering for uh, for wrongdoing, but rather rejoice in your suffering when that comes as a result of doing good. It's righteous suffering. And we see this arise in our day only because you're a Christian, that, that there are those in opposition to you and may be the source of suffering. Uh, there is uh, suffering that is intended to ruin us. And this is directed from Satan. Remember uh, 
uh, in the suffering of Job, Satan had to go before God and ask permission and said that if you take everything from Job, he'll curse you to your face. Or you take uh, what the Lord Jesus said to Peter. Peter, uh, uh, Satan has desired you that he might sift you like wheat. So the suffering that comes from Satan is to destroy us and ruin us, to turn us against God uh, and, and, and to accuse God falsely. And then there is suffering to improve us. And this is from Hebrews 12 where uh, the author says that every son whom the Lord re receives chastens. Now when we come to Christ, we still have our old habits, our old way of life, and old thinking. And so the Lord then comes in and he disciplines us uh, through suffering. And we are learn then a, a new way of life and a new way of living. And we want to grow in grace, grow in holiness. Uh, that's suffering to improve us. And then there, there, we may suffer because in life we have made the wrong decisions and we are suffering the consequences. Maybe you make a decision, you don't pray about it, you don't come before the Lord and present it to the Lord, ask the will of God, and uh, you, you think about Lot uh, in, in the book of Genesis chapter 12. He Lot was Abraham's nephew, and their herds grew, and they, there was not enough pasture land. And so Abraham, as gracious as he was, allowed Lot to make the first choice in dividing their herds and their cattle and their servants. And you remember Lot looked to the well-watered pl well plain of Sodom. And there he lived in Sodom, and Peter tells us that his righteous soul was vexed in Sodom. And uh, so sometimes we suffer the consequence uh, of a rash decision, pet impetuous decision. We don't pray about it. So let's again turn to Matthew 7 and read these verses. And we are comparing and contrasting the, the wise builder, the foolish builder. In verse 24, here Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, and uh, Father, we thank you for these words of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that he is presenting here to us uh, this uh, application. What are we going to do with the Lord Jesus? What are we going to do with his words and his teaching? Are we going to neglect them and forget them? Or are we going to be a wise builder and apply them to our life and live by them and be supported in life by them and ushered into eternity by them? So, Father, give us grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we look at this, let's remind ourselves of the foolish builder, as we saw last week. Here was one that was, you know, he, he was uh, building his house, and as we noticed last week, there's, you know, here were two individuals. They were interested in building a house, they both were uh, religious. Both sought a, a moral life, but the, the fool, the foolish builder, thought only about the appearance of his house, how it looked to others. Uh, there was nothing underneath the house but sand, and uh, this is the false professor who is only interested in the opinion of man, 
what man thinks of. He wants to impress man of what a, what, what a, what a religious person he is, devoted and uh, committed. But this is the false professor that our Lord tells about in just the preceding verse uh, in, in Matthew 7 where Jesus says, Not everyone who comes before me in the judgment and says, uh, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, and those that thought they should come in said, Lord, have we not uh, cast out demons in your name? Haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? And the, the whole emphasis on this false professor is upon what they did. Have we not? Have we not? And so the false professor is only concerned about appearance, how they look to people. Uh, and all the good works that they have done, the mighty works that they have done. But there is no, no foundation. There is nothing uh, underneath. And what a sad thing when they reach the judgment in being so deceived. They thought they were going to be ushered in to the kingdom of God like heroes. But to hear those words of the Lord Jesus Christ, depart from me, you, you wicked, you workers of iniquity, for I've never known you. What a, what a terrible thing to face the judgment and, and face it with false assurance. And then there is the wise builder. He too builds a house. He's interested in religion, a moral life, a holy life. But he sees the necessity of a foundation that he built his life on a rock, on the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't give uh, any thought to what it's going to cost him in, in digging this foundation of self-denial, self-sacrifice, self-discipline. He is going to build this house. And he's going to build it with a foundation. And so we realize that the wise builder took much longer in building his house than the false professor. Last week we looked at two things. We looked first of all at the demonstration. Jesus says, whoever hears these words of mine and does them. It is a demonstration. It is practicing the word of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and as I said last week, it's just what James said in James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Now you look at your life, and you, you look how you're living your life, and you ask yourself this, am I putting the words of Christ in practice? Do I live by the word of Christ? Do I follow his commandment? Do I follow his example? And you look at your life and be honest. Are you following the, the, uh, the word of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you following his teaching? And that was the demonstration, the living out, the practicing of the word of God. Ever who hears my word and does them. And then second, there was this illustration. These two builders... They are similar. They, they're both religious, moral. They go to church. They want to go to heaven. But one, as our Lord shows in this illustration, built his house on the rock, on the Lord Jesus Christ. The other did not. Built his house uh, on the sand. Now this morning, we want to look at the reaction. How did these two builders respond? How did these two builders react to the storms of life? Because on both houses, there was rain and flood and wind. And the great difference, as we see as we read the passage, that one house withstood the wind and the rain and the flood. But the other house fell, and as Jesus said, and great was its fall. So as we think about the, the reaction uh, it, it, the reaction to the storms of life, the trials, the hardship, the difficulties of life, its grief and sorrow, 
the first thing we want to think about under this heading, just some general observations of how to react to suffering, how to respond to suffering. The first is this, that there has to be a preparation for suffering. You see, the, the foolish builder, he wanted the easy way. He, he only desired an easy life, a comfortable life. He wanted to enjoy life. He wanted to be happy in life. Uh, so there is no preparation uh, for the storms of life. But then you look at the wise builder. And the, and the wise builder, he expects the storms of life to come. And as I mentioned before, just earlier, that, that suffering comes under the heading of just general suffering. That we live in this world and we are subject to suffering. The Christian and the non-Christian, they get the same diseases. They both die. They, they both struggle in life. They both face adversity in life and problems in life. The one only expected a happy and an easy life and never expecting ever to come in their life a storm, whereas the wise builder knew and was prepared for the storm, for the wind and the rain and the flood to come upon his house. The, the, the foolish builder who sought only ease and happiness, enjoyment, contentment in life was suddenly interrupted by the storms of life. And, and you, know, you know this as well as I do, that you go through life and you're enjoying life and then without warning, without notice, something falls right upon you. Some grief, some sorrow, some burden, and it just happens. The one is shaken. The other is not. And why? What is the difference? One is prepared for the storms of life. Now this foolish builder who thought he was going to have a happy and easy life, a comfortable life, he was shaken. His house fell. Now, when you think about the individual who, who wants to have an easy and a comfortable life, they often raise this objection, this is our second observation, is this, how can a God of love ever cause these things to happen or ever permit or allow these things to happen? Why should people get sick and suffer? Why are there wars and calamities? Why do these things fall on people? You see, they make this objection because there has been no preparation for the storm. And so this foolish builder, this false professor is, is like the, the seed uh, in the parable of the sower where Jesus said in Luke 8, 13, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and those have no root who believe for a while and in time. In time of temptation, trial, hardship, difficulty, they fall away. See, in that desert climate, there's just a thin layer of dirt over the rock. And the sower, as he has you know, his bag of seed on his side, his pouch, and he throws it out, that some of that seed is going to land on soil that is very thin because there's rock underneath this very thin layer of soil. And so the, the, the sun warms up the seed, the rain nourishes the seed, and it springs up. And it's like those that receive the word with joy. But when the root goes down into the ground, what happens? It hits the rock. And the rock is hot from the, the sun. And it burns the root, and the seed and the plant die. They fall away. Now consider the wise builder. 
he built his house on the foundation. And it, the, the builder knew and believed in, in the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he said this, remember in John 16 and verse 33, that in the world you will have tribulation. You're going to have sorrow and heartache. You're going to have problems and difficulty. You're going to have trials. In the world you ha will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. You think of what the Lord said to Ananias as he went and anointed the eyes of Saul at Tarsus after his conversion, this great Apostle Paul. He said to Ananias as he went to Saul on that road called Straight in Damascus you went to anoint his eyes and to receive his vision again. You say to this new convert, this one who has just come to Christ, seeing his vision on the road to Damascus, you tell this Saul of Tarsus now to become the Apostle Paul, you, you say to him that I will show him how many things, how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Or you take what the Apostle Paul said to these early uh, Christians in the book of Acts. He went to Iconium. He went to Derby. He began to strengthen these believers. And what was the word that he gave to these new believers that had just come to Christ? What was his encouraging word to these new believers? It was not that you're going to have a happy and carefree life. You've now come to Christ. All your problems are, are gone You'll never have again a care in life, a problem in life. No, he said to him, he said to them, these new believers, he said, we must through many tribulations enter into the kingdom of God. You see, the, the wise builder never raises this objection. Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow pain, this supposed God of love, God of power and might. Why doesn't he prevent it? No. The wise builder sees this is all just part of life. And he's built a foundation. And his house stood. It did not fall. Then the third observation is this. That to be prepared for the, the storms of life, there is not only this realization that we're warned in the Bible that tribulation is going to come. We're, we're going to have a very hard and difficult life. But this wise builder also knew the wisdom and the necessity of building your life on the Word of God. You remember in Psalm 2, or uh, excuse me, in Psalm 1, verse 2, this happy man, this blessed man in Psalm 1, where he says that, but, but his delight is in the word of the Lord, and he meditates upon it day and night. And verse 3, I will liken him to a tree planted by the rivers of water. See, this is the house built on a foundation. This is the tree that's planted. The roots are deep in the soil, and it will withstand the rain and the wind and the flood. You think of Job. You think about all that came upon him, uh, all the calamity in one day. He lost everything. He lost all his wealth, his cattle, all these things he lost. He lost ten children in one day. And he lost his health. But he stood like this tree planted by the water. He, he made such a declaration. He said, naked I came into the world and naked I'm going to go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Do you want to say something like that in amid trial and difficulty and loss? Well, you have to be planted. you got to be planted on the word of God. See, the wise builder knew. He studies and he meditates upon the, the word of God. He applies the word of God to his life. You know, the foolish builder, he has no interest 
or desire for the Word of God. He doesn't read it. He doesn't take time for it. And the result was there was no foundation in his life when the storms came. But the wise builder, he built his life on the Word of God. And as he read the Word of God, and as we read the Word of God, we read the Old Testament. And can you show me any individual in the, New, in the Old Testament that lived a happy and perfect life without sorrow, without heartache? There is none. You go to the New Testament. Is there anybody there that has lived a happy and perfect life? There is none. You look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, the eternal Son of God. Did he live a perfect and happy life? No, he didn't. You look at church history. You look at the Christians throughout history. They're persecuted for their faith. They're troubled for their faith. None have lived a happy and perfect life. That's why we need to build our life on the Word of God because we see by the Word of God that if we're, we are deluding ourselves, we're in delusion if we ever think that God plans for me a happy and a carefree life. It's not going to happen. When we read the Word of God, we base our life on it, and we see by example of these saints of God throughout the Old and New Testament church history that none has lived a perfect life. The other thing that we can do when we read the Word of God, that we are going, if we're going through some hardship, some difficulty, the Spirit of God will come and help us in our study of the Word of God, he will illuminate our mind. He will open our mind. And as we read the Word of God in our sorrow and in our tears, we may come across a passage of Scripture. We may come across a promise of God. And the, what does the Spirit of God do? He opens our heart and we claim this. God, if this is true, I stand on it. And that's what the Spirit of God does. We, we have to see the necessity of, of building our life, our house, on the Word of God. And then the next thing under this general heading of their reaction to suffering is we, the, uh, the, the wise builder, saw their need of supplication. They saw their need of prayer. There's a great necessity to pray. See, the foolish builder, they may pray, but there's no vital living relationship with God. Prayer to them is formal, ritual, means nothing. They go just through the practice and they pray. You know, sometimes I wonder, what is the difference between the prayer life of Saul at Tarsus and the Apostle Paul. How does his prayer change after he became a Christian? You see, the wise builder sees the need and necessity not only for the word of God, but to pray, to ask God to help you, to ask God for wisdom, to ask God for direction. In Hebrews 4, there's a wonderful invitation given to us. Let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore. That's the application, therefore. It's based on, on verses 14 and 15. Because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ, because he uh, died on the cross, because he rose again, because he ascended, because he is now seated at the right hand of God because he is making intercession for us. Because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ and what he did for us, he is seated next to God, our intercessor. He is pleading our cause. He is showing his wounds. He has died for us, shed his blood for us. So the author says, because of this, we therefore come boldly. We come confidently. We come unafraid. You see, 
The non-Christian, what is their view of God? Of God's nature and God's character? See, Satan has uh, 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 so abused the very nature and character of God that they think God is some uh, mean and austere and someone who's only against me, waiting for me to sin or to fall and to bring judgment down on me. But not so the Christian. The Christian realizes that here is your heavenly Father. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you. You're his child. So we come boldly, confidently, because we know we're going to be accepted. We're accepted in Christ. We're accepted through his blood. The veil has been rent in two, and we come into the presence of God's holy prayer chamber. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Not throne of God. Throne of grace. Where grace flows from the throne. Where grace is dispensed from the throne. Now when we are in trouble, when we are in need, when we are facing hardship and difficulty, what is it that we need? We need grace. Remember, the Lord Jesus said to Paul with his thorn in his flesh, my grace is sufficient for you. See, we come helpless and we come as beggars and we receive grace. We find grace to sustain us, grace to support us, grace to help us, grace to see us through. And it's grace that we might find obtain, receive mercy. Mercy to the helpless. Mercy to the undone. Mercy who can do nothing for themselves in the time of need. See, when we pray, we sense his presence and his help. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. We have this unshakable confidence that we, as a child of God, pray. He hears us, and he'll answer us. You you look at the prayers in the Bible. Did God ever disappoint anyone? Did God ever forsake anyone? No. As we read this morning in in Psalm 119, verse, or 118, verse 5, David said he cried out to the Lord. And he answered me. You see, that's our confidence. We stand on the word of God and we stand on prayer. We need it when we face the storms of life. The wise builder, next observation is this. He had this great conviction. He's facing the storms of life, the rain, the wind, the flood. And the wise builder realizes this. That the darkest storm, the most severe storm that is going to come in his life is when he dies. See, the wise builder has this conviction. That when he's when the wise builder dies, he's assured of heaven. So the ultimate test, the ultimate trial in life when we face death doesn't shake him, doesn't move him. But you look at the foolish builder when the hour of his greatest need comes and the foolish builder faces his hour of death to the foolish builder there is no peace there's no confidence there's no assurance because there is no foundation and when this foolish builder is ready to leave this world they have nothing upon which to stand. They have nothing upon which to rest. They have no promise to claim. They have no assurance. And their house falls. But you think again of the wise builder. His life is based upon Christ, his sinless life, his vicarious death, his glorious resurrection. And that when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're promised that you shall never perish. And we have this assurance, we have such peace and confidence that as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that when I die, I'm going to heaven. You remember how uh, 
Paul, uh, in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18, he was facing certain death through, as a result of Nero. And he said, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work. Now, how will the Lord deliver him? He's going to face Nero, Nero and he's going to face death, beheading, a martyr for the Lord Jesus. He will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for the heaven, for his heavenly kingdom. He will preserve me. And that word preserve is to preserve safe, to preserve unharmed. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Let me ask you this. If you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you, you imagine now you're on your deathbed. How are you going to die? We're all going to die if the Lord doesn't return in our lifetime. We're all going to die. But the question is, how are you going to die? Do you want to die in peace? Do you want to smile at death when it comes? You see, you have to have this assurance, this conviction, this confidence. Where am I going to go when I die? When I breathe my last on this earth, I'll take up air in heaven. See, that's why the, the wise builder is not shaken. You know, we can hear the word cancer or some uncurable disease. There's no hope. Medical science can't do a thing for you. How are you going to face it? How are you going to live through it? It is this and only this that you have to have the conviction that, it, that since I have Christ as my Savior, I know where I'm going. I know my ultimate and final destiny. It's a wonderful conviction. And then the, uh, see the difference in these two houses. One did not fall. The one built on the sand fell, and notice what the Lord says, and great was its fall. Great was its fall. Why would a Lord, Lord say this about the soul of the foolish builder, and great? was its fall. Let me give you two reasons. One is because this, this soul came so close to the kingdom of God. Here was someone, he wanted to build a house, he was interested about God and religion, but he didn't search these things out. He just thought about how things looked and appearance, and he came so close to coming to faith. But when he died, he was still lost. You remember the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, in Acts 24. He was standing before Felix, the governor. And there, Paul tells us in Acts 24, verse 25, that he reasoned with Felix about uh, righteousness, self-control, and judgment. And I could imagine Felix quaking as he sat there listening to the Apostle Paul and how the fear of God came upon him, uh, of righteousness, because he had none, of self-control, he had none, and of the judgment to come. That stark reality sobered Felix. And how did Felix respond? He came so close. But he remained lost. He said to the Apostle Paul, you go away and I'll call you and I have a more convenient season. So close. Another one, you think of, of King Agrippa. And there the Apostle Paul again, as he did with Felix, he's making his way to Rome and to Nero and he's had these stops and approached these uh, Roman officials and these Roman governors, King Agrippa. And there the Apostle Paul uh, recounted his life, his conversion, and his service to the Lord Jesus. And what did King Agrippa say? Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. You see how close an individual can come to the kingdom of God, but they remain lost. 
They remain undone. Another reason why this house that fell, that it was a great fall and great was its fall. Because here was a soul that was created by God. Here is a soul that was made in the image of God. Here was a soul for whom Christ died. And they're lost. They're, it's like the lost coin or the lost sheep. The lost son. Great was its fall. And then the next thing under this heading of the reaction to suffering is the consolation. Is this, the wise builder knew this, that yes, I'm going to go through the storms of life, the winds coming, the rain, the flood, but he realizes this, he does not go through life alone. You see, the foolish builder has to do this, and so many do this, that they have a certain philosophy of life that they live by. There's this Stoic who, who says, I've got to get through life my own. I can't show emotion. I just, just knuckle under and I get through it. I'll do my best to be a man through this. I'll show no emotion and I'll work through this by myself. You see, that's the foolish builder. But not so the wise builder. The wise builder knows the very promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in the upper room in John 14, verse 18, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not abandon you. I will not forsake you. I will come to you. You see, the, the wise builder knows this, that whatever we go through in life, no matter how how, how, how deep the valley, how dark the valley. We do not go through it alone. We go through it not by some philosophy of life that we have to do. No, we go through life with a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. You, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, he said, and Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. I am with you always. Always. You think what the, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, in verse 13, that wonderful verse that I'm sure we've all claimed at one time or another. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, that's a wonderful promise. But you think about this. You think about the promise. We, we, we read it and we think about it, meditate upon it. But life is easy. You know, everything is going our way, and we look at it in theory. Yes, this is a wonderful promise. But, but we don't challenge the promise. We don't call upon the promise. We don't claim the promise because we're not facing any difficulty in life. Paul wrote this, you know, after his experience of imprisonment, those, after those uh, two years in prison, and he writes this letter to the Philippians. But Paul, at one point, is challenged. He has to practice what he wrote. He was facing Nero, and he knew he was facing death. He, it, it was his greatest need and greatest challenge in life. Paul said in, in, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 16, as he was called upon to go to Nero, but all forsook me. There he was all alone standing before Nero. What was he going to say and what was he going to do? But Paul realized that he sensed a presence. In verse 17, Paul says, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Do you ever sense the presence of Christ in your life when you need it? Do you ever sense the power of Christ when you need it? You see, that's, that, that's our, conf, uh, our confidence in, that Christ will never leave us or forsake us. And in the trying hours of our life, there he is when we face 
the storms, the difficulties, the problems of life. There is Christ. He lived it. We have a faithful high priest who lived on this earth, and he knows what it's like. And there he is standing by us, giving us the power that we need, the strength that we need to get through life. And then the last thing is the consolate, the conclusion. That's this. There's only two possibilities. There's only two roads. There's two professors, the false and the true. The false builder, the false professor built his life on the sand. The wise builder who possessed real faith built his life on the rock. In whatever philosophy of life we may adopt, let me ask you this. Will it stand in the test? Will you be able to stand and face life by yourself without Christ? That's a test. But this wise builder, he knew he needed Christ. He knew he needed to live by Christ. And he knew that Christ would stand by him. And the result was his house did not fall. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. And uh, Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that flows from the very holy throne of God. Here we are in this life. We're weak. We're frail. We face so many things in life, so many problems. Father, it seems like we face one problem and it subsides and there may be a little period of rest, but then comes another problem. That's how life is, one problem after another. And, but we thank you, Father, that we have a compassionate high priest who knows us and understands us, who loves us who has promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will come to you. And we thank you, Father, for all that is ours in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.